Hi, everyone. I'm Scott Branley. And I'm Alicia Coakley. Every member of the church has a story to share, one that can instill faith, invite growth, and inspire others. On today's episode, we're going to hear how one man's experience fighting against the church led him on a journey to finding truth and peace back in the gospel. Welcome to Latter-day Lights. Hey everyone, thank you so much for joining us on another episode of Latter-day Lights. We're so excited that you're here and we're super excited to have our special guest speaker today, Dusty Smith. Dusty, thanks for joining us today. Thank you for inviting me. So we're, I'm, I've never heard your story, your full story before. And Scott's daughter, Clarissa, love her. She actually um, has been telling both Scott and I, you have to have Dusty on your show. He's just incredible. He did this fireside when I was on a mission and she was just rave, just raving about, you know, your story. So I'm, I'm very, very excited. I know a little bit about it, a little that you told me and a little bit that Clarissa told me, but I'm really, really excited about hearing this whole amazing experience that you had and how it helped with your testimony. Um, but before we get into the story, Dusty, why don't you tell our listeners a little bit about yourself? Again, Dusty Smith. Uh, I am a managing attorney, um, oh. also a former Army Lieutenant Colonel, and a, a former city councilman in a town in Texas. Um, wow. And when I, 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 there's not much more to say than that. I have a beautiful, wonderful wife, and I have three kids, two dog, three dogs, three <laughs> snakes, and four lizards. Oh, oh fun! <laughs> Very nice. Very, very cool. Well, thank you for your service, first of all. My dad was in the Army as well. He was a 82nd Airborne Division, so he liked jumping out of airplanes. I don't jump out of airplanes. I'm perfectly fine staying in things that keep me in the air. So, <laughs> But that's that's an incredible resume. Very, very cool. <laughs> well, um, I do want to jump out of an airplane at some point, and my kids do too, but my wife told me that she would divorce me if I ever let my kids do that. So that's probably not going to happen. I am. I'm with Darla on that one. <laughs> so Dusty, um, we are super excited to hear about your story. Um, all that we know really is that you had kind of an Elma the Younger uh, conversion experience after fighting against the church. I mean, but it sounds like such an amazing story. So why don't you share it with us today? Be glad to. Um, I like to start with the beginning. Uh, okay. And I was I was born in 1960. Um, my dad back then uh, wasn't always the nicest guy when he drank, and he drank a lot. And and uh, my mother would come in and she would say, "It's not you, it's the alcohol." And so I told my mother when I was five that I would never drink alcohol. And so I never have not because of any religious uh, reason, but because I didn't want to be like that. Um, so I ended up being raised by my mother and my grandparents. Well, my, my grandfather was Catholic. My grandmother was Baptist and my mother was Lutheran. I didn't know if I should stand, sit, kneel, sprinkle, dunk, or pour. Um, <laughs> but, but I did learn to love the Lord and and, uh, and I, my, my going to all three, I began to wonder why are they teaching so many different things all using the same book? Mm -hmm. Um, but I, I, I went to church every Sunday and, and when I was at college at the university of Texas in Austin, um, in my, my, I think my junior year, I got a phone call from a friend, uh, we had a family friend. She was running home from school. She was about 13, running home from school. I thought the glass doors on their house were open. They were closed. Mm. She ran through the glass doors, landed on a piece of glass that pierced her throat and killed her instantly. Oh and I became incredibly angry with God. Um, and I, I thought, you know, if, if this is what you do to people that love you, I got, I want nothing to do with you. So I stopped going to church. I stopped doing anything. I, you know, I didn't stop believing in God. I mean, I still believe God existed, but I didn't want anything to do with it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I graduated from the University of Texas in 1982. 
1983, I went home to visit mom. Well, I went home because washing clothes was free and, uh, <laughs> and the fridge was always full. Right. And my mom had been to, to Salt Lake city on business and somebody had given her a book of Mormon, which she put on the bookshelf in my old bedroom. So while I was washing clothes, I wanted to read a Louis L'Amour Western. I had them all on my bookshelf called the Louis L'Amour Westerns. And as I was thumbing through the, the books, the Book of Mormon fell off my bookshelf. And so I sat down and opened it up, just happened to open it up to Third Nephi and began to read. And I became incredibly intrigued. So I went to the phone book. And, and when I when I talked to, to groups of, of families, I always have to explain that a phone book was about this big. <laughs> yep. mm-hmm. And it had names and phone numbers in it. Yep. And if you were short, you would sit on it at the dinner table. Um, but, but this, but you know, this is, this is where, this is where y'all are really strange. If I want to look at Catholic, you know, there's parish, it's easy, Baptist church, it's easy, but y'all had wards and you had stakes. Yeah. And I didn't know who to call, but it was lunchtime and I was hungry. <laughs> okay. So I called the steak. Right. It makes sense. And the steak, and, and a guy answered the phone and he said, you know, I'm never here during the week, but. I, I came by to pick up something I forgot on Sunday during lunch. It happened to be the state president. He just happened to be there when I wow. called. And we made arrangements that I would meet with the missionaries at the university warden in, in, at the University of Texas. And I met with the missionaries and in a few, a few short weeks, uh, I was baptized as a member of the church. And I was 23 and a college graduate. And immediately... Immediately, people would say, you know, you should serve a mission. And I would say, <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm an adult now. I have a college degree. I have a job. I'm not going on a mission. They'd say, okay. And pretty soon somebody else would walk up. You should serve a mission. And I would say, <laughs> I'm adulting. <laughs> they also would say, you should serve a mission. I would say, I am never going to serve a mission. <laughs> So anyway, while I was at the NPC, um, you know, I was I was 24 when I went on my mission, and uh, I felt like I was babysitting. Mm. All these 19 year old kids running around. You know, this was 1984, mm-hmm. and when I became a member of the church, a lot of my friends and family turned their backs on me when I became a when I quit a good paying job to go on a mission where I wasn't going to get paid. My family thought I was insane, yeah. and so. Yeah, I'm I'm thinking, you know, if nobody cares if I'm here, I'm just going to go home. Mm-hmm. So I went to the payphone at the MTC and I called church headquarters in Salt Lake. <laughs> and I said, if nobody cares if I'm here, I'm going home. And the poor receptionist said, uh, can you hold for a second? <laughs> so I held for a second. And pretty soon I, I, there's a voice on the phone. He says, Elder. If nobody else cares if you serve a mission, I do. My name is L. Tom Perry. What? What? So, Holy cow. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. So we chatted. He heard my story, and he said, you know, Elder, if nobody else cares if you serve a mission, I do. And I'd like you to be my pen pal. So when I was on my mission, Elder Perry was my pen pal. Oh, When I came back gosh. off my mission. He invited me up to his office in Salt Lake to give him a mission report. So I, I got to meet him in his office in 86. Wow. Um, That's cool. After after oh, my mission, I, I went to law school uh, and, and, I, and it was in a foreign country. Uh, well, you know, Michigan. And, um, <laughs> and in my. I was born in Michigan. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's okay. I did not grow up in Michigan. We're okay. <laughs> well, I went to law school in Michigan. And in my, in my third year, I went to the pageant uh, in Palmyra. And I encountered what I'd never ever in my in my six years. This was 89. So I've been a member of the church for about six years. And I encountered for the first time in my life anti-Mormons. And they were everywhere. And I debated with them. And I came back from that trip uh, back to Michigan um, wanting to to be smarter, 
wanting to be able to defend the church better. So I began to read all these old history books and doctrine books, and I began to read and hear and, and hear things that I had never read and heard before in my six years in the church. And in 89, if you asked questions, you were told, don't ask questions, just have faith. Mm-hmm. Don't ask questions, just have faith. Now, that's not that way anymore, but it was back then. Right. And so as a, as a law school student, I thought, you know, if, if, if they're not going to tell me anything, they're hiding something. Hmm. And I woke up one day and I no longer had a testimony. So I wrote a letter to the stake president and I said, take my name off church records. And a few weeks wow. later, I got a letter back from the stake that said I'd been excommunicated. And I wow. was incredibly angry. And that's what started my anti-Mormon, 26-year anti-Mormon crusade. Wow. That's, oh my gosh. Okay. So, holy cow. So, do you feel like there was like a turning point when you started, you know, researching the church history and stuff like that, where you just almost like a light switch or was it kind of things that just built on each other and you finally were like, I'm not getting answers. So I just give up. Um, light switch, probably not. When I, when I, when I, um, when I say I was anti-Mormon, I would go to other churches and teach against the church. Wow. Okay. I would go to the Baptist church and give classes against the LDS church. You know, I, mm-hmm. I would write articles. I would stop missionaries on the street and argue with them. And then I discovered wow. the internet where I yeah. could argue with people from the comfort of my own home. And right. if, if anything was the kind of the start of this would be in, 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 in about 99, um, I joined a group. On, on, on the internet called what do Mormons really believe? And I went to go tell them hmm. and uh, they hated me there. Oh my gosh. They hated me. I was so uh, obnoxious uh, yeah. and, and, and hateful, bitter, hateful. But I met a guy named Mike and Mike lives in, in Springville here in Utah. Mm-hmm. And Mike and I had these just drag down, drag, drag out debates, just horrible bloody debates, but we became friends. And Mike began putting my name in the temple every week in 1999. (laughs) And I would say, don't do that. Don't do that. It's false church, false false temple. Don't do that. But he never stopped. Right now. And in about 2009, I had to go to uh, the, I was an attorney in Dallas and I had to go to, uh, the, the border to do a deposition. And I came back from that experience, uh, from that deposition with a souvenir. I came back with the swine flu. And I don't know if y'all remember the swine flu, but oh, yeah. unlike COVID, we didn't mask up and we didn't have, you know, and there was, and I, I was incredibly ill and uh, I called the, I'm a disabled veteran. So I called the VA and I said, uh, I'm dying. And they said, what are your symptoms? And I said, the ones you get when you're dying. And they <laughs> said, uh, they said, uh, well, don't come here. You know, have you been to Mexico? I said, yeah. They said, don't come here. They didn't want, they didn't want me to get any of their patients oh, sick or get dang. themselves sick with the swine flu. So I'm laying in my bed in Dallas, Texas, on the second floor of my house in Dallas, in my deathbed. And I knew I was going to die. Everybody was dying from this thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And there was a knock on my door and my oldest son inexplicably let two missionaries into my house. Wow. Worse than that, he brought them up to my deathbed. Oh my God. Okay. And one of them, I kid you not, looks at me in my deathbed, sweat pouring from, I had high temperatures. I mean, just, it was, it was fever was really bad. I mean, I was just really sick. And he looks at me and said, you're sick. (laughs) I remember thinking, man, the spirit is strong in that one. Um, And and, uh, he said, can we give you a blessing? And I said, will it get you out of my house? And they said, yes. So I said, then give me your blessing. So they laid their hands on my head, gave me a blessing, and I was immediately healed. Uh, wow. I don't, oh I don't gosh. mean my fever got better over the next few days. I felt better. No, in that moment, my fever stopped, my sweating stopped. 
I was give I got wow. strength in my body. I was able to stand up for the first time in, in days. And I walked him downstairs to my front door and said, do not ever come back to my house. Oh, my um, gosh. <laughs> so when wow. I say I hated the church, I hated the church. Sorry, did did they just show up randomly or were they invited over by, you mentioned your son or? A random visit. Oh, my god. Well, goodness. Uh, they well, were not invited by anybody. Yeah. Right. Not <laughs> random to Heavenly Father. He knew what he was doing. <laughs> wow. <sighs> In 2014, my wife was transferred to, uh, she was offered a promotion in the company that she was in, and but she would have to move to Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And, and I don't know about y'all, That's but awesome. the words promotion and Baton Rouge, Louisiana never belong in the same sentence. <laughs> no. <laughs> nope. But she was... <laughs> Was, she was, she said, should I take this job? And I said, yes. And I said, we'll have a plan. You take that position. It's an, it's a promotion, but soon there'll be hopefully the same position will open up in Texas. You go there, we'll visit each other once a month in Shreveport about halfway and, and until you can move back to Texas. So she did. Wow. She, she went on to, to Louisiana. Also in 2014, I joined this other website where I could argue with Mormons and I'm sitting there arguing with these. And this woman messages me and she says, I feel very, very strangely drawn to you. Can we communicate? I, I wrote her back and I, I was country boy is my screen name and hers was garden girl. So I said, dear garden girl, we can communicate, but I must advise you. I am married. And she wrote back, dear country boy, I'm 76. Get over yourself. <laughs> uh, so, so we chatted and, and it turned out that uh, she said one day, can, can, can you give me a phone call? I don't want to type. I want to, you know, so I still didn't know her name. I said, sure. So we're talking on the phone and she said, <coughs> do you have any relatives in the church? And I said, I do not. And I said, hang on. I might. Back in the 80s when I was a member, there was a guy I heard about. I don't know if he's still alive, but he was in the church and he's a big mucky muck, was a big mucky muck. His name is Dean Jesse. Y'all ever heard of Dean Jesse? Mm -mm, I haven't. Have you heard of the, the, the series of books, the Joseph Smith Papers? Yes. Yeah. That's his baby. He is the church historian emeritus. Wow. Okay. Okay. So they said, wow. They said, uh, I said, so if, if he's still alive, then yes, I've never met him or talked to him, but if he's still alive, then I got somebody in the, in the, in my family's in the church. And she said, wait, Dean Jesse's your cousin. I said, yes. And she said, Dean Jesse's my cousin. Turns out that, that she's a long, she's a long lost cousin. I never knew existed. Oh my God. Who was strangely drawn to me. Um, wow. <laughs> meanwhile, my wife in, two, in January 2015, she gets a call from her company. She had taken that district that she had taken over as a district manager from the in the 40s in her company to the top four. Wow. And in January 2015, her reward for that was the company called and said, um, we're going to close your district and you'll get your severance paperwork. So she called me. She says, what do I do? I said, come back to Texas. We'll figure it out. But the next day, the vice president of the company called her and said, don't sign anything. <laughs> he said, there's an opening in Baltimore. You, it's a two week vetting process to, to do this, to, to do any move like this. But but uh, it's an opening in Baltimore. Stay there. Put in for Baltimore. Uh, and, it, and, and she said, should I do that? And I said, yeah, we have a plan. I won't visit you every month in Baltimore because I was in Dallas, but, yeah. but we still got the plan. You'll come back to Texas as soon as that opening comes up in Texas. So I called my friend, Mike, remember the guy that I used to debate with on the board. Yep. I right. called him and I said, Mike, do me, he and I were friends. I said, do me a favor and pray that Susan gets this job in Baltimore. And he said, I'll do it. And then is when I made my fatal mistake. Cause then I said, however, 
if the Lord really wants me to come back to the church, he will send Susan to Utah. <laughs> now, there were no openings in Utah. So I felt very comfortable saying that. There were no openings in Utah right. that day. <laughs> the very next day, the person in Utah retired. And the very next day, Susan's paperwork was transferred from Baltimore to Salt Lake. And she was hired immediately without the two-week vetting. Oh, wow. my gosh. Okay. So... You're not feeling any of these spiritual two by fours that were hitting you in the face. Like you didn't feel any of well, them. <laughs> well, I called my friend, Mike, and I said, you're not going to believe this, Mike, but Susan is going to Utah. And Mike said, well, you know what you told God? I said, I was just joking. <laughs> and he said, God wasn't. <laughs> and wow. So that night, that night I hit my knees and I said, okay, Heavenly Father, this is what you want. Great. But for 26 years, I've had questions. For 26 years, I've had issues and no apologist has been able to answer them. No, nobody has been able to answer my questions. So if this is what you want, that's fine. But I need answers to my questions. And over the next few weeks, I'd wake up in the middle of the night with a new answer that I'd never heard before. Really? But that worked for me. Oh, until wow. I woke up one day in March of 2015 and I had my testimony back and wow. I called Mike and I bore my testimony to him and he wept. Oh. Now, a few weeks later, wow. I came to, I came to Salt Lake to visit Susan and it was a three day weekend for me. It was Easter weekend and my law firm had it had good Friday off. So I was there for a three-day weekend. And every day I walk five miles. I can't, I can't run because of my bad knee from the army, but I can walk. So I, and I was out doing my five my five mile walk, and the Lord says, This is home now. And I said, uh, no, it's not. <laughs> I live in Texas. Mm -hmm. And the Lord said, This is home now. And I said, uh, no, it's not. <laughs> I have a job making good money in Texas and I have a house in Texas. You may have seen it, Lord. <laughs> and the Lord said, this is home now. And I said, oh. Lord, Susan does not want to live here forever. We have a plan. So I get back to the apartment that Susan's rented. And I said, baby, out of curiosity, what do you think about Utah? And she said, been wondering how to bring it up to you. I never want to leave. Wow. wow. I said, okay. So I go back home and I call a realtor to come look at my house. And the realtor came in and said, you can't sell this house. And I said, why? He says, now that, that was built in 1929. Okay. It had a lot of issues. I loved it. It was in the historic district in, 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 in uh, Dallas, but it had a lot of issues. He said, mm -hmm. you, you have foundation problems, wiring problems. He said, you will spend thousands to get up to code. You'll never get what the house is worth. You can't sell it. I said, okay. So I called Susan and told her, and she said, we'll figure it out. Well, I got rebaptized. The next week, I get a knock on my door. I answer the door. A guy says, I want to buy your house. I said, my house isn't for sale. He said, don't care want to buy it. I said, sir, I appreciate that more than you can imagine, but I can't afford to fix it up for you to sell it to you. He goes, oh no, I want to buy it as is. I said, how much? And he told me, and it was more than the house was worth. Oh my gosh. I called Susan. I told her and she said, man, when God wants you someplace, he really <laughs> wants you someplace. Wow. Now, the rest of that story is about a year later, I am sitting in Utah in the apartment and I get a phone call from Dallas and a guy says, I want to buy your house in Dallas. And I said, my house is, is already sold. He said, are you sure? I said, You're pretty sure I was there. He said, well, did you get the money? I said, and spent it. <laughs> 
And he said, hang on a second. He began to rustle some papers and he goes, huh? And I said, what? And he goes, the person that bought your house disappeared. And that house is abandoned and in foreclosure. What? What? That house stood in foreclosure and abandoned for four years. It wasn't until recently that somebody else bought it and fixed it up. Wow. What? That's crazy. Holy cow. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I, so, I'm like flabbergasted. <laughs> what? So, the so then Suze wants to take me down to Moab uh, to see the arches because up until then, the only arches I heard about were McDonald's. <laughs> and I get a phone call on Saturday morning. I'm in my hotel room in Moab. Susan's getting ready. And this woman says, I see you've just been on uh, the, the church website and you want information on the church. I said, nope, that's not true. <laughs> and she said, well, sir, your name popped up on the screen and your phone number as somebody who'd been on the website wanting information on the church. I said, be that as it may, wasn't me. Mm -hmm. And she said, well, sir, how do you propose to tell me I got your name and phone number? I said, I do not know. But my computer is in Salt Lake and I am in Moab. And she, what, she says, wait, you remember the church? I said, let me tell you a story. <laughs> so I told her my story. She begins to cry. And she said, I'm at the MTC. I'm having a crisis of faith. And they put me answering these, these calls from people that visit the church website. Oh, my gosh. Your name and number came up. So I called you. And thank you for your story. I'm going to go back and finish my mission. Oh, my goodness. Um, wow. A few weeks later, <laughs> wow. I get another phone call. And this one is from, this voice says, is this Dusty Smith? I said, yes, it is. And she said, would you please hold President Nukdorf? Oh, my goodness. And I said, <laughs> yes, ma'am. <laughs> He's my so favorite he said, uh, in the whole wide world. <laughs> I told my husband I would said, leave my husband for him. <laughs> 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 I don't care about the age gap. <laughs> He is like the Sean Connery of the church. I love him. <laughs> oh. so he to chat with me. And so um, I went to chat with him and he said he was going to tell my story in general conference, but he wouldn't use my real name. Wow. So um, in the October 2016 priesthood session of general conference, he talks about Alma and Amulek and tells my story. Wow. Um, one final yeah. thing in, in, in early 2017, uh, Susan and I went on a date. Well, we went to a gun show. Um, I, I don't know how y'all date in Utah, it's, it's but in Texas, date. we go to gun shows. <laughs> <Yeah>. um, <laughs> well, I needed a holster because mm -hmm. everything we owned was in storage, you know, a big house, a little apartment. Everything we own was in storage. So I saw a table where there's where they're selling holsters. So I'll go over this table. I start talking to the guy and he says, you're from Texas. And I said, yes. And he said, what are you doing in Utah? I said, let me tell you a story. <laughs> so uh, he said, wait a second. That, that conference talk was about you. And I said, "Wow." yes. He says, well, can we chat for a minute? And I said, sure. So Susan and I and this guy walk over to the Sandy Expo Center, into a little corner, quiet corner in the Sandy Expo Center. Another fellow follows us over. So I tell my story. I get done. And the fellow that followed us over said, you're from Dallas. And I said, yes. And he said, Oh, Cliff. And I said, yes. He goes, you don't remember me. But eight years ago, you had the swine flu. No way. No way. And I get your blessing. What? Holy cow. Oh, I now, have chills. The rest, oh. the rest of that story is that after his mission, he went inactive. 
before the 2016 General Conference, his bishop said, I've had it, enough of your inactivity. Here's a ticket to the priesthood session. He goes to the priesthood session. Here's a story of Alma and Amulek, and it reactivates him, not realizing that the story was about a person he had given a blessing to eight years earlier. Oh, my God. Wow. Wow. That is incredible. So you ask if there was, if there have been miracles and, and this is where I tell people that this is how you know the church is true. Not because of the miracles, but because the Lord loved me so much that he allowed these things to happen. And that, and I have people walk up to me all the time and they say, I pray for one miracle to happen to me. They seem to happen to you all the time. And by the way, I've only told you a handful of what really happened. There's other miracles I haven't told you. But they, and I, I say, look, the miracles happen to you too. The difference is I don't believe in coincidence. Coincidence is God's way of staying anonymous. Everything has a reason. And I see those miracles. They happen to you too. And I tell people, I'll tell you how I know that God loves you because he gave you a prophet. And if you've been a member of the church your whole life, you may not realize just how cool that is. <laughs> but in this country, there are 40,000 different denominations, mm -hmm. all teaching something different using the same book. Yeah. Why? because they don't have a prophet. They, they read something, they go start their own church. I mean, look at the Church of England, started because the king wanted a divorce. Right. You know, and if you just start your own church, 40,000 denominations, because they don't have, in a time, if you go back to the Old Testament, it says that God will only speak to us through prophets. And in a time when we need the prophet the most, are you saying that God does not want to give us one? When I was coming back to the church, a friend of mine said, I can't believe that you want to believe in a prophet. I said, I can't believe that you don't. He said, what do you mean? I said, okay, tell you what, you have three kids, right? He said, yes. I said, here's what I want you to do. When they turn 18, bring the kids in and tell them, after your 18th birthday, I'm never going to talk to you again. Everything you'll ever need to know in your future, we've either discussed during your childhood, it's in your journal, or, or we have family traditions, but I will never talk to you again. He said, I couldn't do that to my children. I said, so what you're saying is you're a better father than heavenly father. He said, wow. I never said that. I said, sure, because you believe that's exactly what God did to us. He said, after the apostles are gone, I'll never talk to you again. Everything you need to know is in the Bible. He said, I never looked at it that way. I said, you got some time. <laughs> well, I love that oh, analogy. Goodness. Yeah, that's amazing. well. You know, it's it's. It, I get people all the time that say, you know, I about issues in the church. Well, I, I get thousands of since since the books and the the magazine articles and the videos and the everything. I've had thousands of emails and messages. Most of them say thank you for your testimony or whatever, or thank you for your message. But every now and again, I get people to say, well, what do you think about this or that? My biggest question. <laughs> What do I think about polygamy? My answer, mm -hmm. I say, I love it. I got 15 wives. <laughs> um, you know, funny story. I, I, did, a, I did a fireside for uh, the women's prison. And I told that little part, right, that little thing right there. And two women in the front row, of the women, two prisoners stood up and said, where do we sign up? <laughs> and Susan stood up in the back and yelled, you don't. Um, but yeah, you know, you know, what I tell people is I don't care about polygamy. It doesn't affect me. But look, any, any issue with the church you want, any issue, we'll, we'll use polygamy. Mm -hmm. Two options. It's from God or it's not from God. Mm -hmm. Now, if it's from God, as I, we say in the army, above my pay grade. Yep. But if it's not from God, 
And I'm not saying polygamy is not from God. I'm saying as an, you know, as a, as a what if, what if it's not, then it would be by definition a mistake. And if a prophet makes a mistake, is he still a prophet? Yes. Yes. Moses killed. Noah lied. Peter denied. Mm -hmm. The job description for prophet does not say perfect. So I go back to the basics. When you see these negative things, go back to the basics. Did he have the first vision? Yes. Did he interpret the Book of Mormon? Yes. Look, I have a college degree in journalism, minor in English, a law degree. I'm a published poet. I'm a published author. And I'm telling you, with all my education and experience, I could not write that book. And yet we be- the detractors want you to believe that an uneducated kid did. Mm-hmm. Not yeah. possible. Yeah. I mean, if I couldn't write it with all my experience in education, you think that an uneducated kid could? Yeah. Not happening. Not happening. And so I tell people, go back to the basics. Go back to the basics. Did he have the first vision and did he interpret the Book of Mormon? If those two answers are yes, and they are, then he was a prophet. And if he was a prophet, then this is the true church. And that's all there is. And that's it. There's there's no, well, he did polygamy. So what? He's still a prophet. Well, there's this. There's this. The, the bank in, in Ohio. That's okay. He's still a prophet. None, none of those facts undo the first vision and the Book of Mormon. Right. None of them do. Yeah. That's awesome, Dusty. I mean, I think we're kindred spirits because I just wrote a book and you basically just quoted it. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> I, ha- I have a- almost everything you talked about in my book. I have the 40,000 church stuff, the polygamy stuff. Like you-, you basically just quoted my book and you haven't even read it yet. Well, you know, the, the, the thing that I tell people is it doesn't matter if you believe in God or not. It doesn't change God. If, if you don't believe in God, God still is there. God still loves you. And I, 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 I quote a, a play I did when I was in, in high school called The Company of Wayward Saints. And it was about a group of improvisationists who'd go around from place to place and the audience would give them a scene to act out and they would act out the scene. And in one scene, I played a, an old time doctor who did house calls. And I'm on the front porch of a house where I'm making a house call, talking to the father perspective father because the, the mother's about to have a baby and he looks at me and he says as the doctor shouldn't you be doing something and in the play I say when God is ready he'll let us know and he looks at me in the play and says do you believe in God and here was my answer in the play that's a difficult question for a man of science to answer but I'll tell you this I know God believes in me wow. and hmm. If there's any message that that I try to leave to people is it doesn't matter what you've done. The Lord loves you. It doesn't matter what you say or think. The Lord loves you. And no matter what you say, think or do, Heavenly Father will always believe in you. And that never changes. Wow. That's incredible. So, Dusty, I got a question for you. Ask me. (laughs) When you decided to come back... Um, so I've thought about this, like with Alma, the younger, he did a lot of damage, right? Um, before he came back, how did you handle that? Like, because you had, you had written articles, you had, you had had content out there. How do you bring it back? Like, how did you overcome that? I'll, I'll, I'll give you one worse. I served my mission in Honduras. When I was in the army, I spent a year in Honduras. I looked for people that I baptized and apologized to them. Oh, wow. And I'll tell you, <laughs> I'll tell you how I, how I overcame that. When I met with Elder Uchtdorf, back then he was President Uchtdorf. Mm-hmm. We were sitting across in his office facing each other. I was sitting in one chair and he was across from me in another chair. And he asked me, do you have a testimony of the atonement? 
And I said, that's a trick question. And he said, what do you mean? I said, because I believe in it for you. I believe in it for all y'all. I don't believe in it for me. And he said, why not? And I looked down at the floor and I said, because I spent 26 years fighting the church, trying to hurt the church, trying to damage the church. I don't deserve the atonement. And he called my name. He said, Dusty. And I looked up and he had that smile on his face that he has in general conference. And he said, your sins are forgiven. That's how I got over it. Wow. Wow. And I will tell you one other, one other little thing. When I came to, to Salt Lake, my wife was Southern Baptist. And she said, I'll go to church with you. I'll go to functions with you. I'll support you. But I will never, ever, 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 ever get baptized. And I never tried to force her or, you know, I, although I, I, I did this, though, I, I would say, hey, baby, my <laughs> patriarchal blessing says I get sealed in the temple. I'd like it to be with you. <laughs> um, <laughs> when I met with President Nukdor, <clears throat> he met with Susan was there and he looked at her and he said, you bring what you know, we'll add to it. And I know that Dusty wants to be sealed to you in the temple. I'll save a place for you. Aww. And the next day she said that she was ready for the discussions. And a few weeks later, I had the a unique pleasure of baptizing my own wife. Aww. And then in 2018, we were sealed. Wow. Wow. Oh, my goodness. That's that incredible. Is incredible. Holy cow. Well, Clarissa was right. Jeez. <laughs> this your whole experience is literally something that I don't think I can ever forget hearing at this point. That oh man, I I just want more. Like I I want all the other miracles. I want all the I want all of it. <laughs> Did you have you sat down and written a book? Yes. It's called well, yes, it's called uh Trial of Faith. Um which, you know, the whole attorney thing, he's kind of clever, isn't it? Um, uh -huh. I didn't think of the title. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> you're you're among authors here. I'm I'm writing a book too. And so that, I love it. I love the title. I'm going to have to look it up. <laughs> I'm going to tell you one thing more that I, I really haven't told publicly yet. In January of this year, I was diagnosed with cancer. throat cancer and which was odd since I'd never smoked or drank mm -hmm. and the doctors, well, the doctor said, look, we're going to slice open your throat and you can kind of see where they slice my throat open mm -hmm. to take out lymph nodes. He says, your nerves surround the lymph nodes. So it's unavoidable. We're going to have to cut, nerves. So when you come out of surgery, you probably will not be able to smile, may not be able to move your tongue well, may not be able to lift your arm over your shoulder because it's in a, it's, we just can't avoid cutting nerves because they're wrapped around. We're taking out 20 lymph nodes where the cancer is spread to my lymph nodes. Wow. So we're going to, you know, it's in that. It's, so when I had my blessing and, and, and by the way, I've not once have I said, why me God? Mm -hmm. Um, and when I had my blessing, I, I told um, the person, I said, do not pray for my healing. Don't do that. I've never once prayed for my, me to be healed. I have not ever prayed. What I prayed and what I had them bless me with is, Lord, I know you have the power to heal me, but your will be done. And if it's your will that I be healed, I will be. And if it's your will that I not be healed, then you have something else in mind for me. I go into surgery. It's a four hour surgery. They take me out of surgery, put me into ICU. And of course I'm out. I'm in the ICU because I could still die because they can't bandage the wounds at my throat. If it starts to bleed again, they can't stop the bleeding. Oh. Right. Mm -hmm. The doctor comes out to my wife 
and says, I've never seen anything like it. And she says, what do you mean? He said, we would take a lymph node and the nerves would just fall off the lymph node. So we would cut the lymph node, go to the next lymph node, the nerves would just fall off the lymph node. We didn't wow. have to cut a single nerve. Oh my gosh. Wow. Wow. Dustin. So I would, now for me, I wake up, I wake up in ICU and the first thing I do is raise my arm. I can do it. I can, I smile, I can smile. Of course, I don't know the story yet because I haven't talked to Susan. And then my IV went berserk and they were having trouble with my IV and the two nurses come in and said, we can't find your veins. We're going to, we're going to have to go find something to find your veins. One nurse left. The one nurse who was there was a, a, they were both male nurses and the male nurse leaned over that one that stayed and he says, are you a member of the church? And I said, yes. And he said, would you like a blessing? And I said, yes, he gave me a blessing. They came back in and my nerves and my veins appeared wow. and they were able to, re to change my IV. Oh my gosh. Wow. wow. That's incredible. <clears throat> Do you feel like having been able to witness so many and to recognize, not just to witness them, but to recognize so many blessings and so many miracles in your life. Do you feel like, do you feel like you're at a point now and maybe this is too personal, but I, I don't, I don't have, I don't know. I don't have any boundaries with people, unfortunately. So, um, do you feel like there has been a true conversion that's happened because I know the scriptures talk about the difference between a testimony and a conversion and, and how, when, you know, uh, where is it in the new Testament that talks about when you're converted to, to lift your brethren, right. To, to tell your story, to, to get out there and to let your, uh, we just studied it in, um, come follow me too, where we, we talked about to, share, I guess the transgressions, share the sins, but in a way that lifts other people. Do you feel like you've, you've experienced that true conversion? You feel like you're solid now? When I, uh, when I came back to the church before I could get rebaptized, I had to have a church court. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I, I was in my church court and the stake president in Dallas was with me and that stake was with me in Dallas. And he was kind of my advocate sort of, um, telling my story and everything. And, and so one of the high priests said, how do we know you won't hear something else negative about the church and decide to leave it again? And I looked at him and I said, is there something new? <laughs> because <laughs> I've been using all the old stuff for 26 years. <laughs> so, <you> know, <laughs> if there's something new, tell me now, because the new, the old stuff's not going to affect me, obviously. And he went, okay, fair point. Um, let, let me say that, that I, I don't ever want there to be the impression with anybody that I have a testimony because of the miracles. Mm -hmm. Okay, because the, the miracles didn't bring my testimony back. It, the, the miracles made me open to the idea of my testimony coming back. Mm -hmm. What brought my testimony back was a change of heart. In 2009, when I got healed from my, from my um, swine flu, I actually went to the, to the, out of curiosity, went to the state president in Dallas. And I said, um, if I ever wanted to come back to the church, what would I have to do? He says, we'd have to have a church court. You were excommunicated. I said, I didn't do anything wrong. I will never have a church court ever. I knew anything wrong. Cut to 2015, six years later. I'm praying. I, I tell the Lord with an open heart, I need answers to my questions. Questions start coming. I go to the state president. It happened to be the same guy. <laughs> and I said, if I want to come back to the church, what will I have to do? And he smiled and he says, I still remember you. He said, the answer hasn't <laughs> changed. You've got to have a church court. And my response was, whatever it takes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I went from, I will never have a church court to, I'll do whatever it takes.
-hmm. The miracles opened my eyes, but the Lord opened my heart. And when I got my testimony back, I truly almost had like it was a vision in my head that the Lord walked up to me with his hands cuffed like this. And he said, okay, this is your testimony. I've kept it safe for 26 years. Wow. This time, take care of it. And he touched my heart and I had my testimony back. Am I truly converted? What do you think? Um, I will tell you that I know all the negative stuff more than you do, probably, <laughs> because I researched it mm -hmm. to hurt the church. And I tell members all the time, don't argue with non-members because you're never going to know as much about the church as they do because they study it in order to argue with you. Right. I know all the ne negative stuff. Mm -hmm. I know all the bad stuff. It doesn't affect me anymore. That's amazing. Yeah. You know what I love yeah. about that, Dusty, is it just, as you were saying that, it just reminded me of just how much, how much that is so in sync with our Heavenly Father. You know, Heavenly Father, He knows all of our bad stuff, doesn't He? He knows all of our good stuff and all of our bad stuff. There is no hiding from the Lord. Like, there's, there's no getting around what you've done or thought or the person that you were or are currently, you know, and yet he, I feel like is so converted to us, you know, like he loves us so much and he just will never stop putting forth the effort to show us that love. Right. He loves you as much as if you were the only person on this earth, you know, yeah. And again, you go back to the no coincidence. Think about this. I was in Dallas. The VA in Dallas is horrible. Horrible. The VA hospital in Dallas is horrible. The VA in Utah, in Salt Lake, is wonderful. And it's right across the street from one of the finest cancer facilities in the world. Yep. Huntsman. And the Lord brought me here. Wow. Mm-hmm. You think that was coincidence that I happen to be when I get cancer, I happen to be in near a wonderful VA. The doctors that did my surgery were from the Huntsman, which is one of the finest cancer facilities in the world. I did all my radiation at the Huntsman. Yep. Would have been unavailable to me in Dallas. Dusty, is there is there anything that you would like to leave um, our listeners with to to end things off. I love the name of the, of your, of your, of your podcast Thank or you. video cast, whatever, whatever <laughs> this is. Right. Latter day light. Because the Lord is light. Mm -hmm. If you read the scriptures and look up light and, and, and research the word for light, it, it, the Lord is light. We, we, and, and then we become that light. When you have the Lord in you, you become that light. And the old song, you know, you keep your light on a, in a, in, under a bushel where nobody can mm -hmm. see it. Are you going to open it up and let people see it? And if I, it's kind of like a smile. If you see somebody without a smile, give them one. You know, if you see somebody without the light, give them that light. Then they're, then it's like a candle that you light when you have the, the group of candles and you, one person lights a candle and then they go around and start lighting. Everybody starts lighting everybody else's and pretty soon you have everybody with the lit candle. If we can share that light, if we can spread that light, if we can be that light that lights others, it's like, I don't want people to see me. I want people to see the Lord in me. If that makes mm -hmm. any sense, mm -hmm. I want them to see that light. In me. And if they see that light in me, Maybe it'll help them get that light. And then if they get that light, maybe it'll help others get that light and get that light and get that light until it spreads out like the ripples of, a, of, a, of, of water. And so I, I love the name of, of, your, of, your, of your podcast because this is how we spread the light. 
Well, and you're helping us to do that, Dusty. You're helping us to spread that light. And that's the whole reason we started the podcast was to share light just like you are with us today. So thank you so much for coming on and, and doing that. That means a lot to us. Yeah, definitely. That was seriously one of the most powerful stories that I've ever heard. And I'm my cheeks hurt from smiling. <laughs> I'm li- literally in pain right now because I just couldn't stop smiling through the whole thing. Um, I, I love it. I just, I love so much that you are not hiding your story. I love so much that you're not letting things like guilt or shame or remorse keep you hidden because you, oh my gosh, you're, you're like a modern day scripture hero. <laughs> you know, you really, really are. You have this incredible experience and I'm sure a lot of it was hard and, um, and sad and lonely sometimes and very frustrating. And you mentioned anger, uh, having a lot of anger and, and just to like the, in the few moments that we've, we've had together and stuff like that, I can tell that you are a force for good. And that just, it just warms my heart. And I don't know. It's just incredible. So you're going to be forever my friend. Okay. So we're just, <laughs> just, we'll go out to lunch together when I'm in Utah next. And <laughs> you can bring Ukdorf along. I won't mind. <laughs> well, thanks so much, Dusty, for being on with us today. And thank you all of the amazing listeners and people that have watched this. Hopefully, Dusty's story has shared some light and and really helped you to grow your faith in the gospel today. And if you have a story like Dusty that you would like to share and get some more of that light out there, go to latterdaylights.com and tell us about it so that we can get you on the show and so that we can continue to spread that light. Yeah, absolutely. And guys, Give us some love too, wherever you heard this podcast today, or if you watched it on YouTube or on our, our channel, um, on our Facebook, anywhere else, go ahead and like, share, comment, be that person that can, can spread the light. Cause sometimes it's not your story, right? Sometimes it's just about sharing someone else's story too. And that's totally okay. We need everyone in, in this journey to be able to, to help others, to, to learn, to love the gospel and to build their testimonies and to strengthen them and and to, um, to be able to protect their testimonies too. So make sure that you guys follow us on social media. You know, like I said, uh, like, share, subscribe, comment, do all of the things. We would really, really appreciate it. We'll see you next week. And we'll have another great episode for you of Latter-day Lights. Till then, right. take care. Bye-bye. We'll see ya. Bye.